CEO of Ernst and Young. Some of my CEO friends were here and saying, like, why are we here again? Um, you're here to save the free world, that's all. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a very important uh, session, and I'm really excited to be here with you, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for making this a priority. You all have lots and lots of things to do. This is one of the most important issues I think we all face, and, and I think uh, we got a lot of the right people in the room to help face it. Um, my job in the next five to seven minutes is to just set the stage, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, the next, uh, next speaker for a couple of minutes and we'll get right to the panel. Um, you know, I don't really have to set the stage with the people here. Um, our skills in America are not necessarily keeping pace with what we need and that's true across the world. When I say I give commencement addresses today, I say to all the young students, you're gonna be in a job someday that doesn't exist today using technology we haven't invented yet to fix a problem that we don't know we have. How are you being prepared for that? Well, the real question is, how do we help them prepare for that? There is no doubt that there is massive changes going on. And automation is a major cause. It's going to be one of the biggest societal issues that business and government are going to face. And the, and, the, and the real role today is to say business and government and education, in this case, working together. We have to work together on this. None of us sitting here today can predict whether there will be more or less jobs, what type of jobs will be there. But we can have a role in helping to prepare people for this incredibly dynamic and changing environment. And it's, if we don't, if we don't get it right, the skills gap will get worse. I think you, many of you have heard the statistics that uh, we have more jobs available now than there are uh, people to work at them. 7.3 million vacancies and 6.5 million workers available to fill them. First time since we've been keeping records that that's been the case. There's something obviously going on. And 40% of uh, American business, many of them represented here today, some of the best leaders that I know across the United States, uh, are saying we don't have the, the people coming in with the skills that we need for entry level jobs. At EY is one example we take this seriously. We, we spend a half a billion dollars every year, 13 million person hours uh, training our people. Uh, we give uh, 2,500 online courses available to them. And I can tell you, every one of the CEOs who are here, I know, are doing similar things for their employees. So don't believe that, that they're not trying to do things uh, to make, uh, to upskill and reskill our people. But I won't, I won't kid you, it would be great also if we were getting people with more of these ready skills before they came in our door and we could continue to train them with the new lifelong learning. Which is why I'm so excited to be here today, because that's what today's about. Two great initiatives. Uh, one is the BRT Workforce Partnership Initiative, and the other is the Greater Washington Partnerships Collabs Project that I'm going to talk about in a second. But these programs, in a nutshell, and setting this up, are about businesses getting involved and working, rolling up our sleeves, CEO level, uh, with the heads of universities to figure out what skills we need and convey that to universities and, and uh, other types of educational institutions, the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities that we're looking for. The universities then are taking responsibility for building that into their curriculums. And we are offering our help in doing that, both sitting down with them as teams and offering people to come and help teach. The students who then agree to participate in these programs that are developed by this joint venture will get preferential hiring treatment uh, when we go to look to, to hire people. So we have a commitment to make two, which makes it very real. Who benefits from this? Well, the, Businesses benefits, the students benefits by having opportunities, and the universities benefits, uh, obviously, by, by getting this assistance. With the BRT initiative, leading companies, many of them here, Lockheed Martin, IBM, uh, S&P Global, you, know, you can go down a lot of them, JP Morgan for sure, colleges, universities, states, and unions are all sitting down together to help figure this out. We have 10 pilots going on across the country. Uh, we are also investing heavily in experiential learning and apprenticeship programs because it's not all about degrees, as we know. There's incredibly important need for non-degree programs, and frankly, that's very important to also make more inclusive job growth opportunities across the board. So we're helping to not just create new student opportunities, but also to reskill our own workers, and we're working very closely on that. 
I personally am involved in the Raleigh-Durham area. Um, we're, we're working there uh, to help the technology industry uh, get more accredited people down there, various pr programs with certifications and credentials in addition to uh, various pro uh, learning uh, experiences. And the goal is to have a scalable model that when we do this, we'll take it across the entire United States. So I really um, it, uh, thank the BRT for taking this on and making this a high priority. Uh, it is something that won't pay dividends right away, but is absolutely what's incredibly important for us in the long run. The second initiative, the Greater Washington Partnership, is very similar in the opportunity that it's creating right here in, in our region, in the capital. And again, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, and Northrop Grumman and us and a whole bunch of other businesses are sitting down and trying to work with some great uh, representatives who are here today of our leading institutions here, all the way from Bar Baltimore to Richmond. We're working across the, the line there. It's called the Capital Collab. And we have 11 businesses and 13 universities. And CEO to heads and presidents of the university sitting down and then demanding that all of our teams work together to, to make sure we fill this out. Similarly, we're designing the actual programs that we need to be able to bring people into our organizations. There's two different types of credentials we're working at because not everyone is going to be a coder. So we have credentials that we call generalist credentials that are non-technical careers. We learn about things like statistics and data communication and, and uh, data security. Um, and they're going to be able to analyze various things when they graduate from these programs, all kinds of data uh, and visualizations and risk management. Uh, and then we have a specialist credential, which we need more people in, in obviously, STEM and, and artificial intelligence, data analytics, cybersecurity. And the students are going to have specifically designed programs when they come out to be able to set up neural networks, to be able to use data to solve problems, and be able to recognize cybersecurity threats. So we're working very closely. George Mason University and, and Virginia Commonwealth already have built this into their curriculum. And uh, many other organizations over this fall are going to be building out these same credentials in their curriculum. Um, and once again, once the students complete these curriculums, all of us as employers, and we're a big employer in the region, will commit to hire them based on if they meet all the credentials, to so give them preferential hiring. And so it's a, it's a real commitment on both sides. I'm incredibly excited about the fact that you're all here. I'm incredibly excited about the fact that we're talking about this and we're making it real. And I'm thrilled to be part of both of these. Um, it's my great pleasure now to turn it over to another co-chairman of the, of the Greater Washington Partnership, an incredible regional leader for a long time here, uh, my good friend and great business leader as well, Russ Ramsey, who will give you a further introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you for your leadership. Mark has been an amazing friend and partner from the beginning, um, and he obviously runs a great global company, and he's been an amazing uh, contributor to where we've got to today. Um, before I uh, introduce our very esteemed panel and we get right into this really exciting work, I just wanted to first of all acknowledge a few of the important people who helped got, get us here and just a few, a few people that are in the room today. And so first, I'd just like to thank our hosts uh, at the BRT and Josh Bolton and uh, Kevin Orr from um, Jones Day who allowed us to invade this beautiful home. I want to thank you very much for, for, for making this happen. Um, to our uh, BRT CEOs, um, uh, I really appreciate you being here and being innovators in what is really important work uh, with us today. We have Steve Demetrio from Jacobs Engineering Group, uh, Lance Fritz from Union Pacific, Alex Gorski from Johnson & Johnson, Daniel Houston, the Principal Financial Group, James Keene, Steelcase, Roger Crone, Lidos, Mark Lottenbach, Pitney Bowes, my first job, Tom Leinberger, Cummins Inc., Craig Manier, The Home Depot, Chuck Robbins, Cisco, David Seaton, Floor, Bernard Tyson at Kaiser Permanente, and Harold Yo from Day and Zimmerman, of course, along with um, Jamie Dimon, uh, Mark Weinberger, and Wes Bush. So I thank you all for being here. This is really important work, and, and I think it's going to hopefully be something that you can uh, help join us with. Um, I also want to acknowledge our university presidents, um, and I, th I think maybe I could just start by t talking a little bit about the Greater Washington Partnership and why the university presidents are here today and why they view this work as so important. It was just a little over a year ago, uh, the Greater Washington Partnership would just come into its infancy, and as Mark said, we're basically the business community from Baltimore to Richmond. Um, we came together kind of as a voice of business. Um, Jamie, Jamie Dimon and Peter Shear had, had shared with us that they viewed us as an important region, they really wanted to grow here, but there was no sort of organized voice of business. And so 
Uh, we were 17 when we started. Today we're 27 business leaders and CEOs. We came together around the idea of unity and solutions. And we wanted to focus on the big things that impacted where we work, live, and play. Well, those big issues obviously include things like transportation and mobility. But very early on, we recognized and understood that talent, skills, positioning ourselves to, be, to train student leaders for the, for the next generation was something very important and that we were being left behind. And so literally a little over a year ago, um, we invited, I think we invited 13 university presidents, nine showed up just for a brainstorming lunch. And it was at that brainstorming lunch, we were sort of going a little bit through the kind of awkward moments. I mean, university presidents are wonderful, you know, wonderful professionals, but they don't always sort of play together all that well. And, um, a little bit of awkward moment, and, and Wes Bush dove right in, and he said, listen, I welcome you being here. We're, 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 we're very focused on this issue of skills and skills development. Uh, we have a company at North Grumman of 70,000 people. We moved here to be close to our, our primary customer. We got 25,000 in this area. And he, and he looked and he said, now we work with each one of you individually on a small basis, but it's not enough, and you're not keeping up. And for the next two hours, I applaud all the university presidents because they literally put down their guards, they talked about the issues, talked about things that could happen, and now one year later, record speed on, in any circumstances, but certainly one year later, we now have the Capital Collab, which as you're gonna hear more about later, you know, our university presidents have come together. We now have 13 universities plus the uh, ch uh, chancellor and, and, the, and the University System of Maryland. We have 14 companies which have all come together as part of the collab, including four today that, that I'm really proud to announce that are new, Amazon Web Services, led by Teresa Carlson um, on assignment, and Apex Systems, ASGN now, uh, led by Rand Blazer, uh, General Dynamics and Phoebe Novakovic, and Washington Gas, uh, led, by, um, uh, led by, somebody help me, Adrian Chapman. Uh, is um, have now all come together to kind of work on this important idea of how we increase the volume and skills where it's obvious that that's where our economy is going and it's obvious where the high paid jobs are and the skills that are needed for all of this to work. So, um, so with that, I just would like to um, acknowledge one more group of, uh, of people here, our university presidents, uh, who really have stepped out to kind of make this happen. And, uh, we have with us today, some of which were here with us last, last week, Sylvia Matthews Burrow, who obviously will be on the panel from American University, uh, Jack DeJoya from Georgetown University, Freeman Rabowski from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Tom LeBlanc from the George Washington University, Tim Sands at Virginia Tech, uh, and Bob Corrette, for, uh, the Chancellor of the University of, of uh, Maryland System. And last but not least, we have Angel Cabrera from George Mason, who along with Virginia, with VCU, has actually been the first to embrace our generalist credential. And I think we actually have with us today uh, some of the first students from George Mason who could each of you just stand up and be recognized, please? <laughs> students? Uh, so uh, with that, I just have one final announcement, which it just makes me fills me with joy to announce uh, that to really, I'd say, operationalize and make this Capital Collab, which you do have, and I encourage you to multitask while I'm speaking uh, before the panel comes up, but you have in front of you what I think is a very clear and, 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 and summary description of why this work is so important, because for our, our students to really reach their full potential, they need these skills across all walks of life, and it needs to be done at scale, it needs to be done in a partnership, and it needs to be done in a collaboration, which we hope that along with the BRT, that our work here will be a model, not just for this region, but for the country and hopefully for the world, because this really is the drive and innovation and talent and skills in this area is gonna be key across all curriculum. And so, uh, my, finally, before I ask the panel to come up, I just wanna announce formally for the first time uh, that Wes Bush has agreed to chair the Capital Collab. And we all think this will be the most important work he's done on this earth. So, Wes, thank you very much. And uh, perhaps with that, I'd like to have Greg come up and introduce our panel. And I appreciate everybody being here. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, the rest of our panelists should come up. Jamie uh, Freeman. Wes. Yeah. Responsibility. 
Thanks very much for the uh, introduction. So um, I think this is just a, a terrific panel, and I'm really pleased, uh, honored to be uh, moderating it. I, I'll tell you that in covering economic issues at the Wall Street Journal, there really isn't any issue, I think, that engages and excites our readers and as much as workforce development issues. Uh, whether you're a worker or a manager, a CEO, a, an entrepreneur, you struggle with this on a daily basis. You know, your, success, your, your company rises or falls on finding the right people. And they're not, you're not just CEOs, you're also parents. You know, you've got kids. You want them to like find their way forward and so forth. So I'm just really, really pleased that we're doing this. And we have an absolutely outstanding group of individuals to talk about this. Jamie Diamond to my left, uh, Chairman and CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Sylvia Math uh, Matthews Burwell, President of American University, Wes Bush, Chairman Northrop Grumman, and Freeman Rabowski, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore College. Jamie, let's, let me start with you, if we can sort of like set the scene. We are, we are now uh, looking at a labor market that by some measures is the strongest in 50 years. You know, we heard Mark say we have like more vacancies and we have unemployed people to fill those vacancies. How difficult does this make you uh, life? How, how difficult does this make life for you at running a company, finding the right people? Yeah. So let me just make just for the audience make it a little bit broader than that and tell you why I'm so optimistic because of what's happening here today. In America, 40% of the people make less than $15 an hour. 15% make minimum wage. Uh, we've left behind swaths of people, often in uh, in uh, inner cities where kids don't graduate, and the problems are in high school, community college. You're going to hear a lot about college today. We've got to do something to get people well-paying jobs, part of the system, uh, and it's opportunity. This is a national emergency at one point, and, and when we leave people behind like that, you can have disrupted society, et cetera. So you know, what, what makes me optimistic is that this group, and P Peter started, R Russ started, I, and I'm shocked all the people here, said we're going to do something here. It's got to be fixed locally. It's got to be fixed by business folks, uh, government, uh, the, co the college professors to get together and say, what actually works? And it's, it's different than every part of the country. So like even a company like J.P. Moore, we might have coders in New York, but we need some, you know, ver something very different in Arizona, something like that. So, and so at the local level, you can hook up, what do you need? So here I think they said there are 200,000 jobs for data analytics and another, I've got the number for workplace automation. Uh, and this is how you fix it. This is how society gets better, you know, the collaboration of people trying to do a great job for people. And uh, So tell me a little bit about your, what life is like at J.P. Morgan now. Like how many openings do you have and how hard are you guys finding it to find the right people? Yeah, so we, we hire like 50,000 people a year, so it's obviously a lot. The, the <laughs> hardest part to hire, is, which is great, is the job these folks are talking about, is digital data, uh, data scientists. But obviously we're willing to compete anywhere. So we build our centers where they are. So it's a little bit easier for us, a little bit harder when companies can't actually do that. And, uh, uh, but I, I think it's great. I now hear a lot of CEOs complain how hard it is to hire the people they need and the wages are going up, and that's what we all wanted. That's called capitalism, competing for people, and then getting them properly trained so when they get out of uh, college, they have a well-paying job. These are really well-paying jobs. Uh, Wes, let me ter turn to you. Um, so you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about workforce development issues, and yet you took the reins and uh, you know at that meeting a year ago to set this up. Tell me about what you've seen in the past in terms of when businesses tried to work with higher ed to address these problems. What worked? What didn't? And how have you tried to address those lessons learned in this in Colab? So I think one of the big learnings over the last decade or so has been. All the efforts that we put in, individual company with individual universities, those have been great learning grounds. We've proven what can work, how we can partner. The problem was we could never get to scale. The numbers that we're talking about here in terms of the need for digitally proficient workers are, is huge. Across our nation, it's millions and millions of people that we need. And I thought Jamie made a really good point, and it's, it's not just the defined roles that we have today. We want to offer more and more of our population the opportunity to work in these digitally proficient environments. So we found that these were pilots that were producing small numbers, but they just weren't adequate to scale to what we needed. So the CoLab is, in, in my experience, the biggest of any of these efforts to really scale what we're doing. So as was said earlier, we have 13 universities and now 14 companies involved in this effort to bring it together in a way where we recognize this new digital credential. We're going to offer preference to the students who are getting these credentials through the universities, preference in both the hiring when they actually graduate, but also preference in the internship opportunities. 
So here we are. We have a commitment by the companies, a commitment by the universities. The universities are working together. The companies are working together. We're driving this to scale in this region. And as Russ said, we hope this really serves as an example for what can be done nationally. Because if we're going to solve the problem on a national level, we have to get there. I, I would add a piece to this, because there were a lot of folks who were thanked earlier. All of these pilots that we were doing and the work that was demonstrating that partnerships can actually be successful, it was the Business Higher Education Forum that was leading a lot of that work. And BHEF, through their efforts, actually developed the model for partnering that we're now scaling. So there's a, a lot of learning that underpins the model that we're utilizing here with the CoLab. And I am excited to see how quickly we're making the progress that we have underway. Less than a year, we already have two programs that are, that are granting credentials. We're going to announce another handful here uh, just very shortly. And as we get into uh, the fall, I expect that we'll be announcing even more. Things are moving quickly. Anyone who says universities cannot move quickly enough to match the technology, we're proving them wrong. This is working. Can I get you to put a couple numbers on this? So when you say get to scale, what's your what do you aspire to like have CoLab producing in terms of numbers of kids per year? And for an employer or a university thinking of participating, yeah. how long does it take from making that first phone call to actually getting this thing up and running? Yeah. Well, as, as uh, just in terms of that, that timeline to be up and running, the agility that we're seeing from the universities in adapting their curriculum is fabulous. So less than a year, here we go. The number, let me just let me give you some little insight into numbers. If I just look at our company all by ourselves, the universities that are part of the CoLab, over the last few years, four to five years, we've hired about 5,000 people broadly each year in our company. But just these universities, we've gotten about 2,000 from out over, over the last four or five years. 2,000 people. We need every single one of them to be digitally proficient. Every single person. So this isn't just the computer scientists or you know, the engineers that we're hiring that we need to be digitally proficient. If we're hiring someone to work in human resources, if we're hiring someone to work in accounting, if we're hiring someone uh, to work in supply chain, they have to be digitally proficient. So this is, this is something that spans across all of the disciplines and is intended to help lift our student population into a much more competitive position for the long term. And I think that's why we have such a broad array of universities interested in it, that we're not just talking about the, the, the traditional STEM disciplines. We're talking about all disciplines being involved in what we're doing. Thanks, uh, Sylvia. Um, what is your assessment of how well higher ed has done the job of actually meeting the granular specific skills employers needs, need? And how does CoLab address whatever weaknesses you've identified in that? So I, I think the question of working in partnership, as was indicated, isn't always at the forefront of higher education, but I think it is now, and it has to be. And I think CoLab is bringing together that ability to do it. And why is it so important? What does it solve? Wes talked about one thing that's really important, scale. So if you're a university president working one by one by company by company, any of you all in your companies wouldn't do that in terms of how you bring it together. So CoLab aggregates the companies so that we can hear what the needs are across the companies and what they prioritize a group. The second thing that it solves that's been a problem, I think, and I come to higher education new, so I am a year and a half in, and so I should caveat with that. But one of the other things that seems to be very important is knowing the specifics. So the conversations have occurred at a generalized level. When you aggregate, bring together, and get specific, because people say we need digital, but I think Wes was very clear. What we need, we need two different things. Sometimes you need direct coding skills, mm -hmm. but you also need data and analytics capability. And then how do you meet that? And you have the very specific conversation. So that's what's happened with CoLab, is an ability to have the conversation. What are the courses? What are the skills that we need? And then we as universities figure out what are the courses that we offer that can meet those needs, and then you credential them, because that's an important part of making a market. You as a company have to be able to know. First of all, you want us to meet a standard of quality. That credential has to mean something. But if the credential doesn't exist at all. So the CoLab affords us the opportunity to come together in those ways, scale, and be specific. Um, Freeman, um, I think you were telling me that you don't really actually have any trouble finding jobs for your STEM uh, yeah. kids at, uh, at UMBC. We, so we what? hire every single one of them. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your work here is done. So, um, but, seriously, but really, um, how, does, do, how do partnerships help you fulfill the mission for your kids better? And how do you think CoLab is doing that in ways that you haven't been able to do before? Sure, two or three things. CoLab, first of all, makes the point that this region is a, an innovation hub for the country. 
when you look at the numbers of people already trained in the digital areas. But it also shows the gap that Wes, Silver, and others were talking about. You're talking about 200 plus thousand job openings and are maybe putting out 20 some thousand a year. So we need to place many more. What's really exciting about this initiative is that it will say to the public and to families that we can encourage you to go into computer science, but even if you don't want computer science, because all these jobs require more technology, we can take students from the humanities, from the social sciences, give them a set of courses that will map to the skills that companies talk about, and they are able to get a job as a generalist whether it's in HR, in marketing, or whatever. I mean, too often in this country, we tend to think somebody's either a math science type or they're the other type. If I ask the audience right now, how many of you knew by the time you went to college you were either going to be in math and science or something else? Raise your hands. <laughs> if you knew already that you were either going to be STEM, how many of you know you're not STEM people right now? Tell the truth. <laughs> That's my point, okay? Well, we're going to be saying something very different now, that all those people who thought they were not STEM people actually have a chance to be in this economy and to be involved in this training as in liberal arts broadly and with specific specificity based on the skills that companies talk about. Final point, it is great to see the universities from Virginia to Maryland working together to look at what we're doing and to compare notes as we go along, even as we get feedback from companies along the way. And that's what we're doing. Uh, Jamie, what would your advice be to a, a student? You, I'm sure you talk to students all the time who aspires one day to work for J.P. Morgan. You know what I mean? Would you say um, STEM, STEM, STEM? Go get your two or four year degree in STEM, or would it be something like no? You know, learn, you know, read the classics, study Plato, and then <laughs> and then we'll train you on the job. Like, what's your advice to kids who get these conflicting messages about how to prepare for today's workforce? I think uh, Fr Freeman and West both said right, which is hey, humanities is great. I think learning about mankind is great thinking, yes. anthropology, or stuff like that. But having these other skills on that resume and the ability to go there, and like we have digital, we have data analytic people in every part of our company, including HR, finance, uh, legal, et cetera, because it, it is real and it's powerful. So the combinations, having both the skills to work with people, you know, use computers, uh, underst understand coding. You don't have to be a coder, but it is a huge benefit if you understand coding. That, that you do it. The other small thing, I'm just listening to him, two, two points. One is when you develop this kind of ecosystem, mm -hmm. people will put headquarters here, not headquarters, they'll put part of their company <coughs> because you've got the expertise coming out of the schools. Right. They will build it here, just like they're building a lot of stuff in Silicon Valley or the west side of New York City. The second thing, which is if every, and this is, I think it's unbelievable all you all got together, if every city in America did this, and the added community colleges, you fix a huge part of our problems, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of, kind of a model to be replicated. Actually, Sylvia, and, I, and I just want to give, you know, Wes did this for the BRT. Like every company does something, all the CEOs here, mm -hmm. they actually, we have a book, but the fact is, now we're talking about not just what do we all do, what can we all do that we can replicate yes. in a dramatically exactly. fast way across America that'll help lift us up uh, in a way the folks here, the folks deserve. Well, actually, uh, Sylvia and Wes, I'd actually like to hear you both address the needs of the Washington region. So I'm told that uh, this region, the higher ed uh, system, actually produces a ton of uh, kids with these skills, but it has an issue with keeping them and putting them in jobs in this region so this region grows. What's the problem there and how do we fix it? So I think in terms of keeping students, at American University, 40% actually of our students are in the Baltimore to Richmond region. In terms of our alumni, they're in the region. So many of our students come to our university, particularly stay in the region, which is helpful. But there are a number of other things that can help in terms of keeping the students here. One is, and we've talked a little bit about it, the internships, experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Having that experiential learning, it's important in terms of when they get to employers in terms of the jobs they can do, but having that experience with companies and the collab is going to help with that because students who complete the credentials are going to be preferred right. in the internships that they're going to do that's going to help as well help one thing as a university we're also very focused on engagement with our region that's a part of why we wanted to be a part of this entire effort and as universities become more and more engaged with their communities and their regions these are other things that bring their students into that if it's a priority for the university that we value our relationship with DC and the DC region we're involved in the economics, we're involved in education, we're involved in the arts. Those are things that will help people stay. So I assume you're also happy if they are educated, they get a great job and have to not to be. Exactly. Right. Or not just somewhere else. Yes, I mean, it's fun. Absolutely. But the we kids are. doing well. It's not about just. You know. Absolutely. And that to the point of the, you know, 91% of our students do experiential learning, internships or experiential learning in labs, uh, our scientists. But as you're reflecting, Jamie, a large portion of that, 63 
93% of our students actually do time abroad. And so they're getting it there. So we're happy. We want to make those connections. But I think if you create what you just said around the country, this kind of knowledge between universities and the businesses, you're going to create even more of that ability to do it here or elsewhere. And one, and one of the things that uh, for me was particularly gratifying to see, and business has a responsibility here. This isn't just over to you, higher ed, you know, we need more grads. Business has a responsibility to speak up and say, what is it we actually need? What are the characteristics, the knowledge, skills, abilities of those who are coming out of the university system that we need? And the first thing we said was, we need them to be broadly educated. We've got the best higher education system in the world. Don't mess that up. So we're not talking about changing universities into just job training programs. What we're talking about is and. Do what you're doing and. And we need this digital proficiency. We brought together the companies and the partnership across multiple industries. So we had, obviously, the defense industry. We had the financial services industry. Uh, we had the energy industry. We had the medical industry. Many different industries came together and we agreed on what we all needed in just two meetings. That was phenomenal. The, the clarity around the need across industries is, is highly precise when we're talking about digital proficiency. So we were able to translate those needs into very specific statements that enabled us to work with the universities to, do, to <clears throat> ensure that the curriculum aligned on these credentials. That was a lot of work, but it moved very, very quickly and it enabled us to get where we are at this speed, this remarkable speed. So my point is, this need is not something that's just in little pockets. And your question about, you know, why are we seeing sometimes this mismatch, I think to a large part, you know, reflection, self-reflection on business, we haven't been as clear as we need to be about our needs. And so this is a, an important part of this program, and that will change over time. We're gonna have to keep it current, because technology keeps moving very, very quickly. You know, just I, I think universities have to look in the mirror also. I, I talk about in my TED talk that the majority of Americans who begin with a major in STEM leave it within the first year or two. And the more prestigious the university, more often it will happen. And, and one of the challenges we face as we talk about innovation is to help many more students succeed in those first courses. So we call the first year of STEM courses weed out courses. So many people know about that, and we've got to do something about that. So we need more of the generalists, of course, and to have more people broadly educated, but we also need to help more students who are interested in completing degrees in computer science to be able to do it. In the 80s, we had 36% of computer science majors who were women. Today, it's under 20%. Yeah. So our Center for Women in IT is designed to focus on how do we get more girls and young women who can succeed in computer science because we need those people. When I'm working with Northrop Grumman and we see a woman who's over cybersecurity, it makes a big difference for them to see those people. So I'm suggesting that universities have even more work to do beyond these programs to look at ourselves and our culture to see what we can do to increase the numbers of people who are succeeding. One of the ways will be through a, a rather hybrid approach. Sometimes students can get what they need through courses. Other times it's through online modules. For example, our University System of Maryland has something we call USMX. And the whole idea is to have a platform where students can get certain skills through the online approach and be able to be certified in that rather than having to take the courses. And so we're going to have to be much more innovative in our approach to bringing more people into this work, both at the generalist level and at the specialist level. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what the kid gets out of this uh, program. So, um, you know, I've covered workforce issues a lot. And one of the common complaints you hear about uh, people, kids, you know, uh, considering their options is, well, I'm told that I need to take X, but four years from now, business doesn't want X, they want Y. And that seems to be a constant problem. And the mismatch is often an intertemporal mismatch, which is what was important five years ago isn't important today, and yet the kids coming out of the schools today are working off of what they were told five years ago. So I'd like any of the panelists to address this problem. And I'm just going to read off a little bit from one of the course descriptions, OK? So if you're taking the certification for specialists, among the things you need to do are describe the implications of data architecture on data processing, recognize and explain the importance of key performance indicators and metrics, Discuss the various methods to encrypt data in, in the cloud. Now, first of all, I can't do any of that stuff. Okay? <laughs> and and I'm, we, we it's help great to that. know that if you took me in your program, God willing, I'd learn how to do that. But how do I know that by the time I'm done that, that this, Wes, you or you, Jamie, are going to want that a year from now? That Because this technology changes so fast. So let, let, me, let me give you a, a take on that. The, the world that many of us uh, were very comfortable with, where we went off to university, 
and got our four-year degree and you know, maybe stuck around and got a master's degree or something and then said, okay, we've checked the square on education for our life, let's go get to work. That world is gone. The world today is a world of continuous education. Right. Those who are out there working have to continue to be educated. And there are a lot of models for this, but I particularly like this model of stackable credentials so that as a person progresses through the course of their career or they wanna change the vector of their career, they are able to take these type of credential activities and stack it on and continue to build. It's a building process. So the things you learn about uh, artificial intelligence today, that might help you get a great job today, but you're gonna have to continue to build stack on it as we go forward. The pace of technology across everything that we do, as we said, it's not just in the right. defined STEM disciplines. The pace of technology is accelerating. So we cannot linearly predict what's happened in the past into the future. It is accelerating. And so from an educational standpoint, we need to make sure that we're adapting to deal with that if we're gonna keep our nation ahead economically. We have to be able to match it with what we're doing from an education perspective. As I said earlier, we start in a great place. We've got the world's best higher education system, but we've gotta keep making these adjustments as we go forward to recognize the pace of what we're gonna to have to do to stay competitive. The CoLab gives all of us an advantage in that we can say to families and students, we're working directly with universities. We know what will be expected when you graduate beyond the broad liberal arts. And quite frankly, the specificity of the skills you're talking about can always help. Th those skills will change. And then when you talk about the specialists, you're talking about computer science majors. And they will have had tracks in data science or in cybersecurity or in machine learning, artificial intelligence. Now, they won't know all of those at that same level. But the specificity allows a student to choose a special right. area of depth. And then we're having now online modules to meet the needs of those other skills that they talked about so they can get that and have that advantage. And then when we can say to a computer science major, yeah, you can get a job in general, but you're going to get a special kind of recognition if you have this badge to go with it, and that will allow you to move even faster along the way. So it's the collaboration and the connectedness that can make the difference. I would, just, I would just add two quick things. One is the fact that they're working together, the university, the business, they'll keep the curriculum up to date. Yes. So it's right. not, that's not a major issue. The second, for the kids in this room, when you get that good job, you get constant training once you're there. Right. The company will keep you up to date. It's not like you were trained for X and all of a sudden you're out of luck. No, there's constant, not even, not even traditional training. You sit next to people who are adopting new methods and new computer techniques, et cetera. So once you get that good job and you're good at what you do, you'll be fine. But I think we do need a, everyone to switch into the idea of lifelong learning. Absolutely. Yes. That that's the, the concept in it. Your point about community commerce <coughs> and the investment that you all made this week in terms of that, thinking about it in terms of people need different things at different times. And how are institutions like ours, post-secondary institutions, going to meet those needs? And different institutions may need different needs at different times, but how do we meet those needs along that trajectory with a base that's complex problem solving because complex problem solving in terms of when the students ask what, a, what if it changes. If you have that basic complex problem solving skill, you're gonna be ready for job five, not just job one because the other thing that happens, they'll go back but they're gonna change jobs. And then the second part that I think is important is institutions of higher education. We actually have to help prepare students for the world they're gonna work in. And that's an inclusive world and a changing world. So get some of the basics that you know are gonna be the same and then have an ability to build. Um, have you designed uh, CoLab um, the certification programs to be flexible enough and general enough so that from year to year you can still fit quite a few specific different protocols into it? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It, it will be a living process. So yeah. the knowledge, the, skills, and abilities that we created on day one, in year three, those will be adjusted. And the curriculum that the kid takes this fall may be different from what the kid the following Absolutely. year is gonna take? Just okay. as curriculum continues sure. to evolve. All right. sure. Now, Sylvia, I think I may have first met you when you were a budget director, deputy bu budget director. So the job of the budget director is to say no a lot, right? <laughs> because no matter how ambitious and uh, uh, altruistic our intentions are, money is always an issue. So I want to ask you, there's a lot of demands on, on higher ed. You know, you have to do so much to like fix all the problems Jamie has talked about in society. Do you, does higher ed, do you have the resources needed to meet these demands? I mean, is it expensive and time consuming to create these courses and so forth? And how do you fit all these unlimited demands into the finite resources you have? 
So um, I did master the hug push away uh, in terms of the no um, at OMV and at other places. But this question of what it takes. So what's interesting about the process that we've gone through with the CoLab is most of the courses are in our right. curriculum. Right. I mean, that was one of the interesting parts, that actually we have the courses in our curriculum. What we're doing is bringing together those courses that if you take these <coughs> specific courses, it results in a credential. And so it was a matter of bringing together. In terms of the resources it takes, it does take the time, it does take the effort. We do have to make sure we're meeting a standard. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things I think everyone wants to make sure we're doing. If you have that credential, do you really learn the things that you say? Mm -hmm. But fortunately, it won't mean for us adding faculty unless, you know, it, it will be about what students are taking. If more students start to do this, and I think eventually they will, they will. because at American, when we start it in the fall, what our plan is, is while it starts in the business school very quickly, anybody, if you're a, a major in performing arts at American University, you can get this credential. Okay. And so that it will be able to enhance. But with regard to doing it, it does take time and effort um, and some resources, but I think not as much as you would think, because we actually are teaching many of the courses that folks demand sure. in terms of the data analytics, the statistics, um, and the core parts. And that's in the generalist area for us. You know, universities are businesses, though. We do work to build revenues. Make no mistake about it. So you've got your regular customers. But for us, with a training company in Howard County, we work with Northrop Grumman, for example, NSA, in bringing in people from the humanities, retiring, returning veterans for the new apprenticeship program we have in cyber operations. Jamie, you were talking about salaries. Well, our governor has allowed us to now put cyber into the apprenticeship approach. Somebody comes out with an 18-month, 12 to 18-month program in cyber operations making $80,000. So there are great opportunities, not only with the traditional bachelors that we're talking about or the two-year degrees, but with these certificate programs from a variety of places that can get people into this work. And that will be a part of what we talk about scaling up. Right now, we're working with Northrop in this state and preparing some people from other states to do these cyber operations jobs. We do a lot, training thousands with the National Security Agency. So keep that thought. For the Baltimore, Washington, Carla, yes, it's the companies, but it's also the national agencies that hire a lot of our students. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you get kids into these programs. Um, uh, Freeman, now I understand the retrievers didn't make the NCAA this year, but uh, I understand. But they did well academically, and that's that, the point. All right. And if you had to choose one, which would and it they be? They can yeah. read, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. and they'll get jobs. Yes, they will. <laughs> now, one of the things I understand is that you can actually enter competitions in the, in the STEM field, right? Yeah, that's true, oh, yeah. that's true. So we were 2017 National Cyber Champions. Congratulations. And, to be, and for all transparency, UVA beat us in 2018 in cybersecurity, <laughs> all, right? all right? We give them credit, but we're back on it this year. Yeah, but well, the idea of competitions is a another way of building an ecosystem of kids who are really excited, hackathons and cyber competitions and all the e-gaming that can get more kids and children also looking at these as possible careers. Well, number one, I want you to know that when I do my brackets in the cybersecurity NCAA, I'll have, you know, the retrievers. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll have you have retrievers beating UVA. Okay? Thank just, you very much. Let's get that out. Now, I got a 14-year-old son, love the kid, really good at school, but what he really loves is playing Minecraft, right? And I'm thinking, Hon honey, if you could just put as much effort into your studies as you put into Minecraft, <laughs> man, the sky's the limit. But, I mean, seriously, though, how do you take a kid who has that kind of, like, obvious interest, you know, in a technology and actually like motivate him to turn that into something useful. Does this program do that? I think ultimately it will, but I wanna go back to this notion that was mentioned about women, underrepresented groups, that we're gonna to have to move and do more and more with two-year institutions and with high schools and, be and before that to get kids because they, they still have to have a math background. You can't do the stat without some basic algebra background, for example. You can't talk about computer science if you don't have at least a semester or two of calculus. So that math and science will be important. Reading skills will be very important. I, I, the most exciting program I can think of right now to produce more women, American women, right now is one that's funded, that we get support from Northrop, we get support from NSA, is for uh, middle school girls in coding and yoga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm coding and yoga, all right? And the yoga teaches discipline and stamina, and the coding, the more you do, the better you get at it. And for girls, because the guys are like this, we gotta give them that assertiveness so they can do that too. Now when you have those kinds of programs and you've got women who are over cybersecurity at Northern, for example, coming in showing what's possible, people become excited about it. The, because we like to do what we do well. So they have to have opportunities through these gaming opportunities to do it much more proficiently. Then they get excited about it and then they can do well. 
what's it been like trying to get kids interested in the program, Sylvia? How do you advertise it? How do you pull them in? Is We're at the early stages, yeah. but I think that it won't be a, an, an issue at all in terms of our students. Our students are very excited. When you have 91% of your students anxious to do experiential learning, the average number of internships is actually three at American University. Mm -hmm. And we have to tell them, do not do it in your freshman year. <laughs> You've got to settle in. So right. there, there are many people who are anxious to uh, get the kind of qualifications that the companies want and need. I to your earlier question, I would just say yeah. things like Freeman's describing. At American University, we have a program called the Mass Circle, and it takes kids who are 10 to 15, they come once a week, and they work on a math problem right. as a group. They all have different skill levels, so they know different things, but they have to work as a team, as a group. It is an incredible program in terms of getting that kind of interest, excitement, team-based work, and those are the kinds of things <coughs> for and as many girls as boys uh, in that. I mean, and we start to see what happens because at American University, over 60% of our physics majors are actually women. Can you uh, guys real quickly, so I don't think your kid can have an issue at all because he probably gets introduced to people like this and the newspapers and what's going on in the world and will find his own interest and stuff like that. And you know, apprenticeships, and they, all, they all really work, and a lot of those kids get those apprenticeships. If you go to inner city schools, these kids have no idea what business is. Yes. They've never been there. Yeah. They don't know. And so one of the, the only thing I've ever found really successful is when they get that first summer job, which they should get paid for as opposed to uh, free, and it could be usually 11th grade, you know what the first thing they always say is? It's kind of fun to work. People aren't mean, and I get paid. You know, and they, they get invested in the system. So we have kind of a bifurcated problem here. One is inner cities versus, you know, the, the general population uh, that has opportunity. And I, I want to commend Jamie on what they're doing when thinking about underrepresented groups and almost half the population becoming people of color. We've got to think much more about that group. I want to commend Wes because we work right now in inner city Baltimore. If you go, there was a Washington Post piece recently on Lakeland Elementary. We have a STEM center there, starting there and now with other schools. But what's significant about it is not only teaching them to, to, to come up to proficiency in the math and when you think about common core standards and reading, but it's giving them the opportunity to see people sometimes looking like themselves coming from a company like North of Grumman as engineers women engineers coming in and helping to show them what's possible in the STEM space. So there's that need for that exposure at an early age, coupled with the rigor in the math and the reading that would be important. Um, could you, uh, Freeman, um, to what extent do, uh, do some of these minority kids face challenges and obstacles that other kids don't? And how do you design programs like this right. to uh, specifically address right. those obstacles? You, whether you're talking about children of color or children from low-income backgrounds, the fact is that right now the probability of those young people going on and getting a 40-year degree is under 15%. So you're talking about reading skills first, reading and math skills, thinking skills, but also exposure to the possibilities, which is what Jamie was talking about when Sylvia talked about the math circles. You we need getting them on the campuses, giving them a chance to see what's possible, but also giving them confidence that they can code at an early age, that they can read critically at an early age. And it's more, the more that, that, that they have, the more companies work with universities, and with national agencies to reach out into those communities, the more we can get done. Is it partly an issue of surrounding them with the types of people in the environment they may not be familiar with that says, yeah, this is actually a great career, this can be fun? Oh yeah, and teaching them that hard work makes a difference. The big word on my campus at UMBC is grit. Yeah. Grit. We talk a lot about grit. It's not about whether you're smart or not. Are you willing to work your butt off, quite frankly? It takes that kind of hard work. To, and because we have kids from 100 countries, you see it from people from other countries more so than you do from people who've been in this country of any race for generations. And it's that intensity, this is what you see in New York so often, I mean, but it's that intensity that makes the difference. Because in these areas, you've got to be ready to work hard. So it's, yeah, it can be fun, but it only gets to be fun when you're really good at it. You get my point? You've got to get that level of discipline at an early age that will get them doing the problems. The more you, you learn to do by doing, mm -hmm. reading, math, whatever it is. So I want to sort of pull the, con the camera out a little bit and actually uh, put this in the context the broad of the broader national debate. Uh, this week, the president releases principles for higher education. And as he's been, he and his folks have been talking about for some time, they want to take the focus a little bit off of the four-year college and uh, really sort of like stimulate resources and effort in uh, alternative pathways. A lot of talk about apprenticeships. For example, why can't we make 
Pell Grants eligible for apprenticeships and so forth. And I think it revives an interesting debate about whether the four-year degree is really the be-all and end-all. Now, what's kind of interesting about CoLab is that it's, it does focus on kids in four-year programs. But is that the right focus? You know, to what extent um, is this the right place to be like trying to uh, put our efforts to solve the workforce uh, problem? Or should we be focusing more, as the administration suggests, on these alternative pathways, two-year colleges, apprenticeships, et cetera? Anybody want to? Jim Collins talks uh, about the genius of the and, and. It's versus and. the tyranny of the or. <laughs> that's it. And th that's the point. That's I it. I mean, everybody in here knows four-year degrees are amazing. We need as many people trained at that level as possible. And we need to give people other options, whether it is the two-year program or a certificate program. We're going to need all these people. If you think about going from 20,000 people in digital training up to 200,000 per year just for this corridor, you need all those pathways. But make no mistake, the liberal arts degree is more important than ever. And just to, just to put a fine point on it, if you look at the, the Workforce Partnership Initiatives that the Business Roundtable is sponsoring, we have 10 of these initiatives across the country. A number of them, like the CoLab here in this region, are focused on the four-year universities and digital proficiency. But a number of them are also focused around the country with two-year colleges on advanced manufacturing, where our nation has a huge gap in the number of people that are actually getting produced, not meeting what our nation needs to compete globally in advanced manufacturing. So there are programs underway using this model that are focused at the two-year level as well. And Freeman's point, we're talking and. This is all about scaling what we're doing in a massive way to enable the future of our country, for our, for our economy. We've got to be able to attack this in all the dimensions available to us. So we've got to keep pushing hard on four-year university. We cannot back off on that in any way whatsoever. But we also have to drive hard at two years. We've got to, and there are going to be some alternative pathways yeah. that get created with all sorts of modern forms of education that we need to be open to and adaptive to as we move forward. So this, this is a many, many and yeah. situation, and we, and we have to have the capacity to deal with all of it. And sometimes you learn a lot from traveling around the world. We try to study. So the, the fact is community college can be doing a better job. High schools can be a better job. A lot of high schools, these kids are graduating with jobs in automotive, even coding, or, mm -hmm. or some form of manufacturing, maintaining small aircraft, et cetera. You go around the world, it's amazingly similar. 70% don't go to college, 30% too. We should maximize the 30%. So you go to Switzerland uh, and France and Germany, 70% don't go, 30% do. But because in Switzerland and Germany, you got these wonderful apprenticeship programs, these kids in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, they get certifications. They, they decide they can go to college or they can take a really well-paying job. Unemployment in Switzerland, Germany for young, I think it's men, 17 to 24, is th under 3%. In France, it's 20%. So there are policies that work and policies that don't work. Our community colleges are probably one of the greatest untapped resources in America. They, they just need to, they need to be doing exactly what these folks are doing here, and in conjunction with you, because sure. they need your help, probably. And I think yeah. if you, instead of focusing on the question of should you be focused on the community colleges or should you be focused on the four years and the and concept, if you break yourself into thinking about this as lifelong learning, That's right. mm -hmm. then you, you shift the paradigm in terms of how you think about it. And it's like anything. I came from healthcare. We're precision medicine. Your medicine for you is where it's going to, education is that way. What do you need? When do you need it? How do you flow in and out of it? And how do we as a nation, educa educators, business community and government make sure that we can meet those needs as you have them, you know, in terms of being able to offer what you need. And so I think thinking about it more as a lifelong learning versus is it this or that, that to your person you described, maybe when they're 35, yeah. they want, want to go back and get the rest. And they may be able to do that online. That's exactly or they may be able to do that face to face. Or maybe they just need a credential. Sometimes you need skills. Sometimes you need knowledge. Sometimes you need the credential. But creating a system that can meet those needs and meet people where they are at whatever point they are in their life. You know, most Americans don't realize that almost half of Americans who start in higher education begin in two-year institutions. Mm -hmm. It's just that. I mean, and if you look at this corridor, from Virginia to Maryland, we have some excellent, excellent. community colleges, excellent, excellent. Yeah. who work collaboratively with us. And I've said this for years. I think four-year institutions learned a lot from community colleges about how to be more responsive to the corporate community 
in a lot of places. We have become, we have not always been this collaborative at the four-year level. Two-year institutions knew they needed to work to make sure they were giving companies what they needed. Well, we are learning from them also, and it's, it goes back and forth. Um, in a few minutes, I think uh, I'm going to try and get some, some of you all to sort of like contribute to the conversation here. So we have some folks with microphones, uh, uh, right? Uh, so if you have a question, um, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. We'd ask you to you know, state your name. Um, also, I understand we have some of the students from the program here, and I would encourage if any of you, I would love to actually hear from one of you why you went into this and how it's going. So perhaps when the one of you, if you're brave enough, <laughs> raise your hand, and we'd like I'd love to hear from you, and we can get a microphone to you. But before we go to the mic, so um, what's the value proposition for the kids coming out of this uh, certification program? Um, are they guaranteed a job? And Jamie, what can they expect to earn as a premium by doing this? I, I think you should give the specifics <laughs> here because these are really unbelievable numbers. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the guaranteed a job, I don't know what you do here. So, so what we're doing is we are assuring students who come through the process that they will have a preference in the interview pro in interviewing for both interns and for full time. But like all students, you have to compete. So you want to make sure when you're gaining that credential, you're actually doing well in the courses, that you're learning what you need to in, in, in the courses that you're taking, and that you're going to be ready to compete. But we're going to assure them that they are going to get preference in the interviewing process. and. I am absolutely confident that they're going to be overrun with offers. And just, just looking at what the, uh, the participating companies are, are already doing. And, but this is a great thing. The participating companies on our end of it, we know we're going to have to compete to get these students. That's the reality of it. Every single one of these programs that, that we've been associated with over the years, uh, the students who come through them get multiple yeah. offers. Yeah. And that's a great thing. It's an absolutely great thing. <coughs> Working together, we're raising this pool that we're all competing for. And the, so that's the reality. It's, it's from a student's perspective, it's going to put them in an unparalleled position to be out there in the marketplace and to be a very attractive candidate. That's the value proposition to them. Thanks. What's uh, the compensation, these folks? I, as Freeman was saying, if you're jumping right into the marketplace with a, with a cyber degree, yeah. you're, you're easily at $80,000 a year starting. But what if and you're a liberal are, arts major, like an econ? So it depends. It, it will depend on the field that you're moving into. If if you're a if you're an, an econ major and you're going to you're entering, you know a and you, a and you JP come with your, your new digital digital certification and you're a digitally proficient. Sixty-five, seventy thousand. Yeah, I mean these are a great HR jobs. HR would be fifty. Oh yeah. You know, so there are Easily. other things, but they're real jobs. And they, yeah. Once you start that job, you got dignity, growth, opportunity. And when you start that job with this skill set, you are positioned to grow in your job and in that skill, in your field, much more quickly. So your career progression is going to be accelerated. And as Sylvia said, internships make such a difference. Students who get, take advantage of internships, sophomore, junior, senior year, start off making more money, have several offers in September of the senior year. And for this card, I, I, I have to keep saying it, it's the companies, but it's also the national agencies. Mm -hmm. Some of these national, NSA in many ways is more enlightened than a lot of places. They actually work with our students while they're in high school. Yeah. Kids can get security clearances. So by the time they come as freshmen, they've already worked a couple of years. So they're working the whole time they're at UMBC and they start out at a much higher level because they've had years of experience as a 21 year old working at national agency. Now, they can stay there or they can take that and take it someplace else. But that, that's going to be the future more and more. OK, uh, any questions? Anybody want to raise? OK. Um, so why don't, uh, first of all, any of the students? I think we have one right here. Uh, OK, can I have a microphone uh, here? Mm -hmm. uh, Hello? Oh, sorry, uh, we'll get him and then we'll get you. OK, sorry. Yeah. Just to, State your name and tell yep. us about why did you want to go into the program and how's it going? So I'm Mike Fasil. I'm a senior over at George Mason University. Thank you. Uh, and I'm majoring in management information systems. And so when I heard about this uh, uh, credential, I was actually already in the data analysis minor, which is the program that George Mason is using to run the credential. And really, as a business student with a technology focus, I saw this as an op opportunity to branch out and really get a little bit more exposure in fields like cybersecurity. That was something that I personally may not have gone through in my own class, but decided that I would use this credential as a platform to really branch out and get a little bit better understanding about the different technology um, fields, because IT is not just one be-all, end-all. So using this 
uh, uh, credential, I wanted to branch out. I wanted to get a little bit more exposure. And seeing that this is <coughs> growing so quickly, I, I had to hop, hop on. So I decided that this would be a great opportunity for me as a professional going into the field soon that I would be able to branch out and grow. So, yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, microphone over here, please. Uh, my name is Maria Brock. I'm a student at George Mason. And so when I entered uh, George Mason, I wanted to go into economics, which is my major. But I also realized is that, just like the panel has said, there is just a huge growth in data. You know, we're experiencing such an enormous amount of data that we don't know what to do with it. And so I wanted to, you know, add a little bite to my economics major. So I double minored in data analysis and statistics. And doing this program, doing this credentials, has really uh, opened my eyes to the opportunities there are, but also, you know, the need that there is for people with, um, you know, economics majors, with psychology majors, with biology majors. You know, you know, I may not know how to code uh, data mining, you know, but I know how to visualize data. I know how to grab it. I know what to do with it. And now I know, with my economics background, is what it means you know, how to use this data, not just to, you know, put it on a spreadsheet and give it to the economics leaders and say, well, here's your data. It's no, I can tell them what this means. Mm -hmm. So being in the credentials program has really allowed me to expand my knowledge and to um, provide me with some experience and opportunities to really um, enter the digital world, enter the business world with bite to your major. Mm -hmm. It's a nice That's word, well, bite. Yeah, thank you. Bite. Bite. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, my, uh, back there. Hello, my name is Sohan from the Washington Business Journal. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, my first question is for Jamie. Um, JP Morgan Chase uh, committed to investing $350 million in job training. Um, I'm wondering how much of that will end up in the greater Washington area. <laughs> and my second question is for all of you, part of the panel, how will this initiative and the programs be funded? Um, I'm asking because, you know, students, will they be seeing their tuition rates rise as a result of this? All right, so the JP Moore initiative, first of all, it's <coughs> global. We've identified this as a major issue around the world. We learn from around the world. And a lot of it is, is teaching people, programs at local, mayors, governors, getting to community colleges, in some cases high schools, in some cases uh, universities, kind of doing it exactly here today. And I don't, I'm not sure Washington needs a lot of our money because they're doing so well. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> they're still going to get it because <laughs> Peter Shear is the chairman of Greater Washington Area for J.P. Morgan Chase. And he's got a lot of sway in the company. <laughs> So do you want to address the class sure. question? With regard to the questions of uh, tuition and that sort of thing, as I said, these are classes that are already there. We're going to do this as part of our curriculum. It's important for us to have a curriculum that is fresh, engaged, and what people need and want. So it wouldn't affect in, uh, in that way. As a matter of fact, the board just approved my two-year budget, and actually we have the lowest increase um, on record at American University in terms of all-in cost changes as we try and manage for another important issue that we haven't discussed today but is the cost of higher education. So this needs to be a part of what we do. This is not an add-on. The idea of what the CoLab is and what we're trying to do for our students and to meet the needs mm -hmm. of the ec economy in our region, we need to view this as a part of what we do. The initiative is more about the packaging of existing courses, mapping some of what the companies need to what we're doing right now, and some, in some cases amending what we do right now in certain courses, adding, as I said before, using our University System of Maryland platform, these, these modules to look at specific skills that are needed. But the most important point is this, the more we're able to meet the needs of companies, the more marketable our programs become, the more the, the students want to be there, the more resources we bring in. I keep saying it, universities are businesses, all right? And, but when you're seen as a place, and you can tell families, you can get a great job. 
from coming here, been well educated and a great job, it brings in money. It does. Quick question. Are these credit courses, like you get credit for taking these uh, courses? Oh, yes. And so, uh, oh, a yeah. kid, so a student who's getting the certification does have to make room in their course load. Something else has to go to take one of these, right? Just, yes. Okay. They are Same curricular. They are part Got of it. our curriculum. They are courses. They will receive credit. The vast majority. We are doing some experimenting with, with some modules through this system of Maryland's um, uh, platform to allow students to do some things online beyond the courses. For example, for the specialist, uh, while the specialist, uh, according to the CoLab approach, requires this depth in those three areas, the cyber, the machine learning, and the uh, artificial intelligence, the, the fact in data science, the fact is that the, the level of depth is not the same for every area. That's right. And so sometimes coursework is the best way. Sometimes you can meet that need through an online module. So a hybrid approach for some of the work, anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, did we have, uh, okay. Hi, uh, Rob Cortell. Um, uh, I've uh, started and chair several small technology companies. I'm here under the auspices of the Northern Virginia Tech Council, of which about 85% of our members, I think, Bobby can correct me, are small business. 62% um, of all new jobs are created by small business. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to bring them in, or is this just for the big guys? The CoLab is designed so that as we get it up and running, we will have an uh, open arm invitation to the, all the businesses in the region to come and participate. We're in the process of defining how we will do that, what the, the mechanisms will be, but it is, in, it is intended to benefit the region, all of the businesses in the region, all the students in the region, all the universities in the region. So we're getting it started with the sort of critical mass capability that we have. And our intent is to expand as we're able to get it operating and running. And it's great to see 10 students here today is a good sign that we've got some early success. Uh, I think in the meantime, though, the internships that we have right now, we have 100 companies on our campus. Oh, yeah. Uh, and technology companies. Uh, that, and what's interesting about that is that they have the same kinds of needs as we talk about for North of Grumman. In fact, they helped us to start some of these cyber companies right. that we have there. But I think even in the meantime, any small company should be working with universities to get some of those interns. A lot of kids prefer to work in smaller companies mm -hmm. and to get that experience. So, I mean, there's a lot that can be done right now. Uh, you have a question over there? Yes. Yes, my name is Jim Dyke, and I'm a former Secretary of Education in Virginia, and I'm not a George Mason student, but my daughter is a George Mason graduate, so uh -huh. I'm consistent with that theme. <laughs> but I'm here uh, today in my capacity as chair of the Workforce and Education Committee of the Virginia State Chamber, and we are very much focused on what it is you're doing. We buy into this 100%. Great. We're going to do everything we can. The one point I want to make, and Freeman alluded to it earlier, and that is, if you're really going to make this successful, the business community has to be as aggressively an advocate for K-12 education, mm -hmm. because that's where it all starts. Sure. And we've got a lot of issues now that need to be addressed, like the business community working with K-12 to talk about what should be in the curriculum, the coding. We're starting coding at grade three in Virginia. Yeah. How do you get that business acumen into the K-12 system to understand the soft skills that are necessary? about showing up, being on time, being a team worker. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be advocating for that, but also to focus on the fact that we have a teacher shortage here in the United States and here in this region. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be advocating for getting our best students to go into teaching, to make that a profession that is put on a pedestal like it is in other nations. You look at all the other nations that are outperforming us on international scores. They put teachers on a pedestal. We need to do the same thing here. And if the business community is advocating for that, uh, it will make a big difference. So I would urge those of you here from Virginia to join with us because we're starting a new council in Virginia, a K-12 business council that is going to be an advocate and is a complete complement to what it is you're doing. And it will help feed a pipeline into the program that you're talking about. Can I, can I just add a point to that? because. You're absolutely correct, but we, we've experienced if, you, if the local community, meaning the schools, the unions, the mayors and girls, don't work with business, it does not work. So very often you run into the opposite problem, which is thank you for your money, we'd be happy to take it, but you have nothing to do with our curriculum. There's resistance at multiple levels, and so it's, it takes collaboration. It is not one side or the other. Uh, singly, and it's not money half the time. You know, in, uh, in Maryland, we have a business higher education roundtable that's actually housed on my campus, and, and they have been very supportive of our efforts mm -hmm. to do a lot to prepare people to become teachers, including the, the new certification in computer science teaching. 
Because the fact is that most schools don't have people in those schools who know exactly enough about computer science themselves because you can get a lot done well before college in preparing kids. And so we are working on those things at Merrill. So we are almost out of time, but I would actually like to finish with one question to you, Wes. What's the next step? How do you like take this model and replicate it in other parts of the country? If there's anybody listening who wants to do that, what's your advice to them? Secondly, can you replicate it into other areas other than digital? Absolutely. As I said earlier, we've seen a number of these initiatives get launched. This is the biggest one by far. Uh, the CoLab activity through the Greater Washington Partnership is way out in front of demonstrating that a model like this can scale and that we can get this number of partners to come together across different industries, across universities, across the boundary lines of things like the Potomac River. It's actually working. Mm -hmm. So this is a model that we do intend to take nationally. The Business Roundtable actually has a number of these initiatives underway, 10 of them in total. And our intent is, first and foremost, make those successful, getting all of them up and running, show that the model works, and then continue to grow it. And there'll so, be some process of auditing and accounting and revaluation. Oh yes. to we believe continue. in metrics. OK, got it. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's been a very interesting conversation. I'd really like to thank the panelists. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks,